Uh, well, first, let's have our icebreaker question. If you could be a guardian of any element, what would you choose? Time. Time. Okay. Interesting choice. That would be very cool. There are certain things that I would like to speed up and other things that I would like to have more time to enjoy or accomplish. Um, so if, if I had a magic guardian power, I'd uh, go off the board for time. So the old guardians, the ones before which... Um, were a big mm -hmm. focus of season two while well, the guardians called them chicken because that's just their initials spelt out um i know they didn't point that out in the comics but do you want to talk about how that was discovered <laughs> you know it's a long time ago but uh my i think i just you know the names were in the comic uh so i think i just looked at those names and thought is there any acronym i can build out of those and i discovered chicken and it was funny so i gave it uh, I gave the line to Hey Lynn, I think. Um, I was actually even a little surprised it caught on because it wasn't in the comics. But it, now everyone refers to that group as chicken, which I think is kind <laughs> of hilarious. I'm pretty confident that when they were making the comics, they didn't have that in mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. And it doesn't, you know, if it were one for one, then, you know, Will comes first. No, so, the acronym would begin with Narissa, you know, it, it or cat. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't quite uh, match up, but I figured that the witch acronym itself was really just the girls sort of figuring out, Oh, if you put our initials together, you could get this. Um, and so they did it again with, with uh, Cassidy and Helenor and everyone. And, and, um, and that's what they, wound up with it was the closest they could come to a word and it's funny narissa's nights that she had in the show um went through a couple changes from the comics because originally mm -hmm. she just had i think what the they were called the knights of vengeance um but in the show you had it was the knights of revenge which was like old foes from meridian so how did that idea sort of come about the first group was the knights of vengeance then um it became the knights of destruction uh, when I came aboard, obviously the first thing I did was watch uh, the 26 episodes of the first season and read uh, as many of the comic books in English that I could get a hold of. I don't speak or read Italian, um, and I'm not quite sure why it worked out this way, but um, that meant I wound up getting comics from the Philippines, um, which were published in English. Um, and... Uh, so I read all that stuff and I was really interested in doing um, the Knights of Vengeance, but I thought, well, this group isn't vengeful, not technically. They don't have any, you know, they're meeting our heroes for the first time. So what are exactly are they taking revenge for? I don't, I'm not clear on that, but I like the concept of the Knights of Vengeance. And I watched the show and I thought, there's a group of characters here I can use who would want revenge on the Guardians. Another, you know, important thing for me when I was building the season out with the help of the various writers and with the help of Justine Chenet, who was my boss on the show and was, was and is, I mean, she still is, but was at the time, you know, lovely, wonderful, brilliant, um, and incredibly helpful. But one of the things I wanted to do was constantly be sort of upping the stakes, you, so the idea was to start with these knights from the first season of the TV series that Nerissa would gather together. Um, so they'd be out for vengeance. They'd then get defeated. But by that time, Nerissa will have created what we renamed the Knights of Destruction, since I used the Knights of Vengeance name already. Um, and that paralleled the comics version of the Knights of Vengeance, but I made it more personal by using Shagon and and uh, Mr. Huggles instead of a random backpacker and his dog. Um, and uh, and then the escalation from that is that Norris is then regathering chicken together, <laughs> um, uh, which is silly as it sounds, winds up being even more dangerous, um, again, because of personal relationships and, and other things. And uh, until finally she's so powerful 
that um, she becomes the threat. And then just to top that off, Phobos comes back. And then just to top that off, Cedric <laughs> finally says, no, it's my turn. And he becomes, you know, the uber villain. Um, and that was the idea is that every time our our young girls felt like, oh, we won. It's like, no, you just won. But now there's an even tougher group that you have to fight that's even uh, scarier. And it, and we just kept escalating that all the way up until, you know, you've got a giant snake attacking um, the town, you know, um, and uh, that seems almost unstoppable. Yeah, I do love with that final battle how um, they ended up projecting so that it ended up on a TV screen there and nobody actually saw what was going on. Yeah, we built things in along the way to, you know, we talked about glamours early on in the season, and then we kept sort of using them and escalating them so that by the end, uh, Cornelia's little sister and Napoleon the cat and Shagon and Kor became uh, their own group of knights, but good knights. I forget what we called them. Oh, the Knights of Earth, I believe. Yeah, something like that. Uh so just this group of uh, heroes who who can build this glamour charm so that the whole world doesn't freak out that there's a giant snake uh, attacking. So there was a sort of, the idea was to create a sort of elegance, I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but something like that, uh, to the solutions by the end. So we've been building the idea of the dragons, we've been building the idea of, of the five girls becoming in essence elementals by the end. But the danger being once they become that, they've sort of lost their humanity. Will they be willing or able to come back from that? Um, by the way, I've just given like 80 spoilers for a TV series. <laughs> so I hope everyone has watched it by the time they're watching this <laughs> podcast. Because um, I'm leaving no, uh, nothing unspoiled. But it is a <laughs> what, like a 15-year-old show, 20-year-old show at this point? Yeah. Um, I'll say I was in uh, seventh grade when it was coming out and I'm turning 30 this year. So <laughs> so that makes me feel very old, but that's yes. all right. Uh, Cause I am very old. You know, we wanted to, you know, plant all these seeds so that by the time you got to those last couple episodes and in particular, the last episode, all these solutions seemed really organic to the series. So you've got the glamor charm, protecting things visually. You've got um, uh, all these rules of magic that we'd established throughout. Um, you have the elementals um, and even what happens to Nerissa at the end falls into, in essence, something that she had built to trap others becomes her own, you know, infinite prison where she's very happy, but none of it's real. Yeah. Now, speaking of Nerissa, she, right at the beginning of season two, um, pretty much, is revealed to have always been the mage or Trill, the side characters. Um, do you know if that was always planned or is that something that was sort of came about into season two? Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously can't speak for the people who did season one, but I also had no communication with them. So that was Disney's decision, not mine. Um so I just, again, as I was watching season one, some of which hadn't come out yet, but I had advanced, uh, back then we used videotape, VHS tapes. Uh, I don't even know if your audience knows what a VHS tape is, but, uh, <laughs> I hope but so. that's what we used. Um, so I had advanced videos of, of every episode. And as I was watching, I was taking notes and I was really interested in the mage and really interested in Trill. And I thought, oh, okay, I can put these things together i wanted narissa to be this very complex villain who had a who was playing a long game you know who wasn't like uh, you know uh this isn't a knock on the character but phobos is like i want it and i want it now so let me try this that didn't work so let me try this so that didn't work i wanted narissa to have this very complex um plan to regain her youth to regain her power to become uber powerful um, to get everything she wanted and she was willing to wait to do that and that included even you know having a son who uh, uh, 
uh, she thought would be useful to her later. Caleb didn't end up being quite as cooperative as Nerissa would have liked. She, uh, you know, had all these long-term plans. And so as I was watching the show, the Magus character um, had all things considered a relatively small part. And I'm like, okay, I can use that. It seems to work that she might have been Nerissa this whole time. Um, and then with the Trill character, Trill didn't even have a name. I think she say, I think in, there was something in the comics about Nerissa's Trill, um, this, this melody yeah. that she would uh, sing or hum. So that's where I got the name from was from the comics, but it didn't refer to a character. It referred to a, 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 a bit of melody. Um, and so I used that here. This character who was nameless in season one appeared a couple times and was very sort of sympathetic to Elian and helpful. And I thought, okay, if I'm Nerissa and I'm playing a very long game, then I'm going to try and help the Guardians in season one as the Magus, as Trill. Um, I'm going to try and get Elian feeling like, you know, I'm this not mother figure, but motherly figure um, so that she trusts me and all this sort of stuff. So that as we move into season two, I can use all that to, uh, to get what I need. And she does. Yeah. It was very organic. And a lot of people seem to appreciate that the previous guardians were fleshed out a bit more than they had been in the comics. Um, so it was very cool. The spin that, that you, your team had put on it. Well, you spoke just a little bit about your experience coming into um, the show after season one. Did you have an entirely different team of writers coming in or was it um, yeah. a few people joined in here and there? Was it just a whole new team? I don't think any of the writers that I used in season two had worked on season one. I had it. And if they did, it was a coincidence. It wasn't like I was using season one writers. Uh, I Again, this was a Disney decision, not my decision. And I never truly understood why, uh, to be honest. But what I, in essence, was told is that uh, they wanted to start fresh. I don't know why they weren't happy with season one. I can't speak to that. I know that, I mean, I had a lot of sympathy for uh, the stories on season one. A, it's never fun to get, you know, taken off a project. It's definitely happened to me in the past. And, uh, but B, I also know that they, created a show that initially was going to be on the Disney channel and then got the decision was made to move it to Disney XD and they wanted it. So what was initially supposed to be sort of a, a school sitcom kind of like saved by the bell, but with magic um, suddenly it's like, no, this is an action show for Disney XD. So there was a lot of, as I understand it, and again, this knowledge of season one is very second, if not third hand for me. There was a lot of, we're going this direction. No, 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 we're going this direction. No, 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 we're going this direction. And so, that, and I, again, I've had that experience too. It's difficult. Um, but for whatever reason, um, the team at Disney were like, we want a clean slate. Uh, and we're bringing you in. We wanted to have uh, an arc to it, which is sort of my specialty. And um and, you know, sort of more complex storytelling than what they were doing. I don't know if they ever asked the original team to do that. For all I know, they never asked them. And so they never saw whether the original team could do it or not. Um, but that's what they asked me to do. I then went in and said, okay, let me watch this first season that they don't seem happy with. And I'm like, this is good stuff. I mean, you know, so I was like, I don't want it to be a complete clean slate. Uh, even though they were asking me for that, I'm like, let me build off what they've done. They did something that was much more an episodic. And again, that's not a knock on it. That's just what they were doing. It was much more episodic. There's sort of a two-parter that begins the season and a two-parter that ends the season. And then in between, it's just very episodic. But I'm like, oh, I like that element. We can borrow that, like the Knights of Vengeance or like, you know, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but the pop singer. Uh <laughs> Vance Michael Justin. <laughs> yes, Vance Michael yeah. Justin. I'm like, I can, I like that character. We can use that and take that to another level. There were all sorts of things in that first season that I thought were great, but because the show was more episodic, you didn't 
get as much time. You know, you'd, you'd have an episode with Frost in it, but there, because it was episodic, you'd probably not have many other episodes with Frost. So let me grab Frost. The character of Raythor, I loved. Um, I just, I love the voice that Steve Bloom did for that character. In fact, I've loved that voice so much that I've had him do that voice for multiple other characters in multiple other series. The voice of Raythor that Steve does um, is also the voice of Zeb in Star Wars Rebels, the voice of Blackie Gaxton in um, Spectacular Spider-Man. In Young Justice, I have him use that voice for, uh, oh, uh, Henshi. There's a character named Henshi in Young Justice, and I have Steve use that voice because I adore that voice. The Knights of Vengeance are honored that our service is prized. And I, again, I had nothing to do with creating it. That was in season one. And and I just thought Raythor is a very interesting character to me. Let me bring him back and make it. And I, you know, made him pretty important in the season because I just thought the character was interesting. The voice was really distinctive and and great. And uh, and I love working with Steve all the time. Anyway, but uh, but that's the show where I met Steve. I think I'm pretty sure. So you know, I thought the first season was uh, had a lot of great material to mine. But because it was episodic in nature, for the most part, um, they didn't have the opportunity to mine it the way I did, the way I could sort of take that and then run it through the whole season, as opposed to, all right, we did that episode, now we're doing a different episode. Um, and again, those are just two different styles of television, and one isn't necessarily better than the other. I know that I prefer my kind of thing to that, but that's personal preference. It's not about what's better or worse. And I just thought there's a lot of great stuff here. Let me uh, make use of it. And that way people who watched the first season and enjoyed it wouldn't feel like, wait, this is a totally different show. I wanted to slowly bring it into being the kind of show that I make. So even the stuff with Will, you know, in the first season, there are four elements. And in the comics, there are four elements. There's, you know, earth, air, water, fire. And Will is heart. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Um, you know, what does she do in a battle? What is, you know, and so we slowly built up the idea. Uh, there's also from sort of medieval literature of, yeah, there are four elements, but there was always a fifth called quintessence. Um, and what was quintessence? That's what the stars were made of or something like that. Well, in modern science, we know the stars are just another version of the sun. So it would just be more fire. But in that sort of medieval idea, it's this fifth thing. It's the soul. It's the that's what heart means. It's the soul, and then that could express itself as electricity, as lightning, and um, so that would give her some power. And she didn't have to sort of launch the guardians and then sort of step back and wait while the other four did all the fighting. She could get into it, and but I didn't want to do that instantaneously. Um, because then again, you know, you're giving season one viewers whiplash, right? So I wanted to build up to that. And that was basically the plan to take all these great elements from season one. We were bringing in the Narissa plot line from the comics and just build it up um, step by step by step. So that by the time we got to the end of the season, it would all feel, one hopes, pretty satisfying. I loved uh, having Quintessence. You had it. It was nice, too, because it brought in abilities that didn't make a chance to get into season one that were in the comics. How much control did you get to exercise over the story? Like, were, did you feel like there was some freedom to it or was you were kind of at the mercy of the times? Um, you know, I got notes. Uh, again, my boss, Justine, was really into what we were doing um every once in a while there'd be a note like uh like i remember i can't remember what the note was but i remember my first section of zambala was uh they didn't go for it and so you know i was just on the phone with justine and i remember we had to sort of talk out okay well, how are we going to um adjust this i can't remember what they didn't like about zambala i know where we wound up and everyone was happy uh, but I couldn't quite, I can't remember now, again, 20 years later, uh, what the original note was, but I remember being really disappointed and annoyed that, uh, you know, this was part of the plan, What, what you know, um, 
suddenly they're balking at it. I basically came up with the plan before we started anything. Um, you know, I broke it down more or less episode by episode. It, it, not like exactly like oh, this is exactly what happens in this episode, but just sort of like here's the basic progression of the 26 episodes. The fact that it was 26 episodes and that which is an acronym suggested to me, all right, let's do as a title sequence, every episode became a letter of the alphabet. And we started with A and what A is for anonymous and went all the way through Z is for Zenith. But I had this game plan. I got notes on occasion, but, you know, nothing that was, um, you know, everyone was pretty much on board what we were doing. So I would say all things considered, I had really tremendous freedom on it. That's my memory of it. You know, I'm sure back in the day, there were all sorts of notes that annoyed me, but because notes always are annoying because you want to think my stuff is perfect. How can you give me notes? But um, but to be honest, I, I don't think there was anything major that really they were like, you can't do this or you can't do that. Um, they were more subtle adjustments. And, and for the most part, I had a lot of freedom. I had, again, um, there were no staff writers on the show. The whole show was freelance. Even I was freelance as a producer, story editor, writer. But, you know, I had uh, a group of writers who came in and each of them wrote, or most of them wrote multiple episodes. They were all terrific. And, um, and I wrote A and Z myself. Yeah, I guess the short answer that I could have said five minutes ago is that, yes, I had a lot of freedom on the show. Um, but it really came out of the fact that I came up with a plan. And I showed the plan to everybody and everyone sort of signed off on the plan. So there wasn't any like, Oh, wait, you want Narissa to be Trill? Where did that come from? It's like, no, I, you know, they had that from day one, more or less. I mean, not literally day one, but pretty close. Yeah, and I have to say, I, I did also enjoy the alf the alphabetized episodes. And I pretty much learned the word Zenith from episode Z. <laughs> so <laughs> I hadn't heard it anywhere else. So I, that's where I learned that one. A lot of people were asking this question, which I'm not sure where you could go with this one. But people were wondering if you had a chance to make the show now in 2024 with like just with your experience now and, and sensibilities now, um, what are some things you might have done differently with season two, possibly? Nothing. I mean, you know, there probably are little things that I'd look at and go, oh, I'd like to nudge that over here or something like that. But in there's nothing, I mean, I'd love to make more seasons, you know, so the notion of, in 2024 of saying remake season two, I'd be like, no, thanks. Just put it on Disney plus and show it. You know, I don't need to remake it. It's good. It holds up. Um, uh, I mean, I haven't watched it myself in a long time, but I'm fairly confident that the, the biggest difference between now and then is the, you know, is the lack of um, smartphone. I think it would hold up just fine. Um, so rather than remake season two, uh, you know, had plans for season three, which we hinted at in Zia's for Zena. Um, you know, building off the comics, we had all these plans and I was bummed that we didn't get to make a season three. I thought it would have been great. And I loved, uh, you know, the whole production was in uh, France. So other than Justine, I didn't have a lot of interaction. Yeah, everything came through Justine to me. And then I would give my feedback to Justine and she'd give it out to the SIP animation. So I didn't have any interaction with them, but I, we had a great group of writers and I loved our cast. And Jimmy McSwain was our voice director who I'd worked a little bit with Ginny in the past in my Disney days, my first round of Disney days. This was did which after I'd been to Disney, gone to DreamWorks, gone to Sony, been all sorts of places before I came back to do this show. And this show I did out of my own office because you know, it was done with SIP. It was a Disney show, but I wasn't working at Disney TV animation. I was working from an office I had in, at the time in Beverly Hills, where it was just me alone. And then, you know, I'd bring the writers in for a meeting. And then I'd go over to our recording studio. And we just had this terrific cast, um, many of whom I met for the first time there, but have used many times since. We mentioned Steve Bloom, but uh, Greg Sipes, who played Caleb. Steve also played Blunk. I worked with uh, Kelly Stables the first time. I worked with Kitty for the first time. I worked with Vanessa Marshall for the first time. Uh, and many others who I've worked with over and over again since on other projects because they're just, they were so good. We had fun. We did musical episodes. I mean, we did all sorts of crazy stuff on that show that was, you know, to me, really uh, it sounds like I'm tuning my own horn. I don't mean to, but I, what 
what I loved about it is that we had the freedom to try all sorts of weird things, you know, a dream episode and everyone's dreams start merging into each other. We did a, a rock concert or at least a pop concert. We did a battle of the bands, you know, um, some episodes would be more comedic. Others would be more action heavy. There was a lot of freedom and flexibility to that. And just a great group of characters and a great group of actors playing those characters. I was really hoping we'd get picked up for season three and was really bummed out when we did. Do you know if it was rating centered or like when did you find out that it was it wasn't happening? Uh, I you know so long ago I'm not sure I mean my guess is is that it was sort of after the fact again you know we didn't have a crew in Los Angeles so it wasn't like this had been a show done at Disney TV animation you'd try to get the pickup before the crew ran out of work. Um, but I couldn't see the crew. I mean, literally or figuratively, I, I, I didn't know when the crew was going to run out of work because they were, you know, 8,000 miles away working for a, a different company. So I just think, you know, we finished uh, the episodes and I would sort of check in and, you know, are we going to get a pickup? Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. I don't even know that they ever said no. It just became clear eventually that it wasn't going to happen. I think everyone was pretty happy with the show. I do think ratings were not. My understanding is, is that um, ratings were very high at the beginning of season one and then sort of trailed off. And then we brought the ratings up in, a bit in season two. Um, I think that, the you know, nowadays with streaming, the kind of storytelling we were doing in season two would have really helped because uh, because we were more serialized. I mean, it was still episodic, but it was sequential. Like you want to watch W before you watch C, you know, uh, you know, you wanted to watch them in order because everything built on what had come before, which was less true in season one because season one was so episodic. Those middle episodes between the two two parters, the order didn't matter quite as much. You know, um, I'm sure there are little subtle things that mattered, but um, it didn't matter quite as much. It was designed to be episodic. We were designed to be sequential, not a true serial, but still sequential. And in streaming terms, that's almost a necessity. You want, if you're streaming a show, you want the audience to finish that episode and go, I got to watch the next one before I go to bed, you know? Um, and okay, I'll stay up a little later and watch a third one. Okay, I guess I'm not sleeping tonight. I'm going to finish this whole series, you know? Uh, but in those days, obviously it didn't work that way. You know, it's once a week. And one thing that was truly annoying is, you know, we had this Halloween episode, but they ended up starting our season much later than they originally planned to, which meant they wanted to air the Halloween episode on Halloween, but we hadn't aired the two episodes that came before Halloween yet. So they actually aired the Halloween episode out of order. It drove me insane. I think because of that, that need to like, oh, I got to find out what happens next. Our ratings went up a bit in season two, but never as high as the original season one premiere. So I, I'm guessing that we're trying to remember, but I'm guessing the ratings uh, were the main reason it didn't get a, a pickup for season three. It just never quite got back up to where they wanted it to be. Because I feel like it would be so easy for if it was on Disney Plus, because it's not there yet. But um I don't know. I feel like it'd just be easy to pick up from where it left off and just keep going. I feel that way too. I mean, I feel that way about gargoyles and a lot of stuff that I mm -hmm. have done. You know, in these days of streaming, when all the episodes are up on a, on a streaming service, I mean, in animation, live action, it would be different. You know, in live action, the actors get older and, and you can visibly see, oh, a lot of time has passed. But if I were doing Gargoyles or Witch or whatever, I could just literally pick up where we left off because no one starts a streaming show. Why would you start in season three? You know, I mean, you'd 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 go ahead and watch seasons one and two and and just be glad there was a season three. Um <laughs> But you wouldn't, if you'd never seen it before, you wouldn't start with season three. You'd start at the beginning. That's where people start with streaming shows. Um, so I'd love it if they put the first two seasons of Witch up on Disney Plus and see how they did. And then, you know, you never know. I'd definitely be game to come back. I have forgotten 95% of what we had planned for season three, but I'm sure if I picked up the comics again and rewatched everything it would start to come back to me i know that we planted the seed of uh the teacher that, uh who comes to the school uh 
who we got from the comics and cast Crispin Freeman to play. And it was a little hint of what was to come, but then what never did come because we didn't get a pick. Because it's like, who's that guy? And then it's... This is Professor Raphael Silla. And I'm looking forward to getting to know all five of you. Yep, everything back to normal. I was originally going to ask what your favorite episode was, but since it's been so long, uh, maybe your favorite concept or storyline that you remember. I don't know. It was a very integrated whole, the whole season. So I was very proud of it. I'm very proud of the work that a lot of people did, you know, not just me, but so many people uh, in France and in Los Angeles. I do think the Battle of Bands episode was incredibly fun to record. I mean, we just had a blast recording that episode um there's a lot i mean there's the silliness of the itsy bitsy spider song and there's all these great goofy songs that the various bands play and then there's uh will to love winged angel from above help me find the will the will to love that's matt's voice that's matt's song the one he wrote for me. Which is a song that I wrote the lyrics for that I'm incredibly proud of. I don't know. It's the best song I've ever written. I don't know if it's uh, actually a good song, but it's the best one I've ever written. Um, so I think that's sort of my, I think, single favorite recording session was probably the, the Battle of Bands episode. I was really happy with the whole plot line. You know, I'd say my favorite character in the show is Ray Thor, but I loved all the characters. I mean, I loved Napoleon the Cat and being able to cast my great friend and mentor Edward Asner is this tiny little kitten. I'm casting Ed Asner as the gruff old Ed as the kitten. That was a lot of fun. Betcha this plan ain't SPCA approved. So, Matty boy, how bad is it? Casting my friend Tom Adcox as, as Will's calculator come to life was hilarious. Uh, there were things I wish we had had more time to play. Some of those... Uh, appliances that Will brought to life were fun and we didn't get a lot of opportunity to play them. Oh, not again. If I had your grades, I think I'd be grateful for the help. Shut up! You're a calculator! Why are you talking to me? How are you talking to me? <clears throat> but we had fun with astral drops and ultimeers and all sorts of great stuff. Uh, I was very fond of the character of Cassidy, played by Susan Chesler. Um, Susan was someone I found working on an English anime dub called Three by Three Eyes that I directed. And I thought Susan was terrific. And I brought her in to play Cassidy. And I truly fell in love with the character of Cassidy and really had all this headcanon about Cassidy and Nerissa's relationship. And um, that, you know, we weren't going to be allowed to explore back in those days. I think now we probably could, you know, explore it more. But I don't think back then they... There's no way they would have let us, but I really adored the character of Cassidy. But I, you know, I I loved I loved Irma, I loved Tarani, I loved Cornelia, I loved Hey Lynn. They were all so much fun, and we had such a huge, varied cast. I, not just cast of of actors, but cast of characters. You know, in, in addition to the five leads, we had all these fantastic supporting characters to play with. Caleb and Blunk you know, really become standouts for me. Matt became really, really interesting as the series progressed. Um, you know, Nigel, all the boys, um, even the bullies you know, became a lot of fun. It it was a, a really nice run there. And we were able to explore some things that weren't even in the comics, like Will's dad and, um, and stepmother or stepmother to be and, and things. Um, it, it was, it truly was a great experience. And I can't remember exactly how long I worked on it. My guess is it was about a year, year, maybe 18 months tops. But uh, yeah, I was eager to do more and really sorry when it ended, because um, I thought we had a lot more great stories to tell. But still, I'm very proud of that season. It was a, a, a great experience. I loved working with Justine. Justine and I are still friends um, and talk, not often because she's a continent away, but you know, we talk a couple times a year and all the writers and a big percentage of the actors are, are I'm still close to. And it was a great experience. Nice. Yeah. And here's hoping that maybe it could come back in some form because 
And the fans are still pretty active for Witch. They actually had re-released the comics again. Recently they stopped just before the end, but they had started releasing them in English further than they've ever released them in English before the past uh, two or three years. So, I mean, I, it's uh, sort of resurging in a way. Yeah, I, I I mean, I haven't kept up with the comics. Again, it was, uh, at least at the time, it was very difficult to get them in English. And like I said, uh, I feel like toward the very tail end, they started to release them in the U.S. in English. But when I started, the only versions in English that they could get fine for me were from the Philippines, where, you know, English isn't exactly the first language there. So I thought, well, this is odd um but okay you know i was constantly asking you know are the next comics out are the next comics out well they're out in italian they're not out in english you know i'm like well can you have some you must have someone there in france who who knows enough italian to translate it for me and they're like well in a month they'll be out and the philippine version will be out and we'll send that to you when it's out so um but it was, uh, you know, when the show did come to an end and it was clear that we weren't going any farther, I, I uh, sort of got out of the habit of demanding Philippine versions of the comics be sent to me. And the stuff that was coming out at that time in the U.S. was stuff from the very first run comics, which was really season one material, not even season two material, let alone what I might use for season three. So I don't know if they ever got to that sort of third series that might have been season three in English or not. But by that time I had stopped looking. They had stopped right at the end of what would what was just season two material. And then, uh, so yeah, I didn't get to read the rest of it until a few years ago because then I couldn't translate it. So <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. so, well, we covered uh, everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, if you've got any other things to add, you can, but <laughs> I think um, you, got, you got all the bases. <laughs> You know, I know there's still fans uh, of the property. I hope that in the near future, there's some easy way to watch those episodes. I don't know that there is right now. Um, if there is, I'm unaware of it, unless you saved, again, VHS tapes from the early 2000s. Um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm proud of those 26. I, I liked season one, but I, uh, you know, no involvement in that. But this, But season two, I'm really proud of those 26. And so... You know, I'd love for people to be able to see them in all their glory. That's pretty much it, I guess. Yeah, well, thank you again so much for doing this. All right, well, thank you. 